Right. <laughs> there comes a time, if you're going to be in ministry, that you no longer are just following, you know, some set pattern or routine that you automatically know the things you're going to say, the people you're going to see, the places you're going to go, the things you're going to do. At some point in time you break out of the bowl and you become more of what God wants you to be, clay. Because once you've gotten out of your program book knowledge, you go out into the field, so to speak, and you begin to learn head and heart knowledge, things that you've tried and experienced in life that work out to be true. I know when I went to work one time for a, a man who built a long assembly machine by hand. I mean, he it had already been constructed, but he took it apart every year by hand. And every single part was laid out, and he would examine it down to the thousandth for wear and tear, because it was built in the 1800s. And it's still used today to assemble paper bags that are put, potato, they're called potato bags, but they're, they're large, tall, square bottom bags that are used in order to assemble plastic bags for potatoes. You know, they send them out to warehouses and things. And it's called a Pot Devon um, bag assembly machine. And he told me when I met him that I was worth nothing to him because I had no experience in what I thought I knew. Because I had a resume. I had lots of book knowledge. I was intelligent enough. I was smart enough. But I didn't have the experience in the field to do the job that he wanted done. So he said, it will take me a year for me to get even one day's work out of you. And I thought he was crazy. Well, this was a Russian, and he had a long beard, and he was a Russian Christian, you know, and he used to stroke his beard, and he'd watch me dumbfounded by some of the stupid things I would do on the machine. And sure enough, though I could set records when it came to productivity, the long-term effect would have destroyed the machine. And he'd been operating that machine in his family for over a hundred years. Interesting. That machine he was able to keep producing over a hundred years, and he never once went after high productivity numbers, but his numbers were always consistent and always at a high level. And every year he would take that machine apart piece by piece and mill it to the thousands. <laughs> it was cast iron, but it was you know one of those things. And I remember that way of his approach to watching me do the things that I needed to experience on my own in order to become less of a apprentice and more of a journeyman, much less someday if I could rise to the years of experience he had to a craftsman like he was. Now, for myself, I know that when I later in life went to computers, the same thing was true. I studied and had cram courses in order to become a network engineer. But I found that the book knowledge was almost worthless compared to the practical knowledge that I needed once I got into the field and began to work with networking and building networks and setting up a casino and then working out the details and the problems that go on with it as well as the user issues you know and the things that exist within the network and network problems that come along when you're working in network engineering or in information systems and I recall that as I learned that I needed to have those years of experience in order to really move into the fact of being that vocation that I wanted to be and that I thought I was so smart in when I graduated. When I first got saved, I used to think that I knew everything and God gave me an unbelievable amount of knowledge about the scriptures. I could recall scriptures I'd never read before instantly, which was word of knowledge, but the practical reality of living out my faith wasn't there. I wasn't able to particularly put into place the scripture that fit the circumstances of life for anyone much less myself. So often, in experiencing those things in life, I began to realize, wow, this is truth, but how it applies is different than what the truth is. It takes the Holy Spirit to personally apply it to my life, 
then I have to experience it in order to really make it fit for someone else to understand and comprehend so that I can share and relate to them Jesus in a personal way so that they know that I know where they're coming from and I know how to help them for where they're going. And that's what happens sometimes in ministry is you find people that are on a learning curve. They haven't quite experienced with God personally working in their life that place where they've broken out of book knowledge into practical reality of living out the faith. That's kind of what Jesus said when he said, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it's not that you're needing to work your salvation or to make it a, a job of works, but that it's working out in your life the things that God has placed in your life. Because you are saved. He's going to accomplish his purposes. But you can do it the easy way or you can do it the hard way. The hard way is kind of like him, you know, kind of like trying to give you a hint that you don't need to walk in front of a truck in order to get run over to figure out that you shouldn't walk out in front of trucks. That's kind of like, you know, the hard way. The easy way is to listen to what he has to say in the first place and don't do it. It's kind of like, okay, you know, don't think I'll walk out in front of the truck today because you know what, I'm getting tired of being run over. That's kind of what we're talking about. At some point in time, you have to step out in faith and stand before God alone and spend time alone with God to hear what he has to say to you. You can only relate that which you personally know about God. You can't talk to someone that's not Jewish about being Jewish. Sorry, <laughs> it just doesn't work that way. If you're Jewish, you know. If you don't, you don't. Hey, I don't try to understand Gentiles. I mean, quite frankly, they confuse the hell out of me. <laughs> they always want to exercise lordship over one another. At least that's what Jesus said. Now, they may not say they want to exercise lordship over one another, but it seems like they're always running for politics. Hey? <laughs> okay, maybe Jesus knew what he was talking about. There's always some democracy somewhere or some issue, but, you know, it's like, well, forget this getting along and working together cooperation. You know, that's more socialism. We don't want the socialism. We want we the people. Right. And that's not socialism? No, it's free enterprise. Oh, okay. Gotcha. But the point is, when you get to a place of understanding that you have to step out in faith, you begin to realize that, you know, you better develop a personal intimacy with God because, quite frankly, once you've stood the onslaughts of the world and its ways and you begin to experience life, you realize your faith is all you have before God. You don't have all the knowledge in the world because you figure out pretty quick Hey, it didn't cut it when you ran into some other kinds of situations that it didn't work in. Having every scripture you can imagine in the world you know, to pull from doesn't give you faith. It gives you a foundation. But the reality of practical wisdom comes to the place of experiencing the knowledge of God put into practical realities of dealing with it in a personal and intimate way by this Holy Spirit of God making it real in your life through living it out in a demonstrative way that you could say my life is an experience of this scripture I have lived this in my life and that's what we mean when we say the word is alive and meaningful to us we have put flesh and blood to the Word of God we have lived out what we say we have done now sadly for some of us we've lived out some of the Old Testament quite easily because <laughs> we've really screwed up a lot <laughs> To whom much is given, much is required. And believe me, sometimes, you know, some of the experiences, whoo, boy. I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> when it comes to sin, no problem. Been there, do it again. <laughs> whoo, dive in. You know, and the reality is, is that God always is wanting us to develop a personal time, a personal place, a way to show us the easy way to live with Him as opposed to the hard way. And that's kind of what God's trying to say in Streets of the Desert today. He's trying to remind us that when you're in ministry and when you are a Christian, you're going to go through things you don't know the answer to. You don't have a handle on it. As a matter of fact, sometimes you're going to be so overwhelmed by it that it's going to shatter your precept or concept of faith that you thought you had. And it's going to level you to the ground where the only thing you could do is cry out to Jesus. Because I don't care whether you're, you know, Billy Graham or whether you're, you know, Chuck Smith or whoever you are, you know, 
whatever you are. Every man at some point in time has doubts. Every man at some point in time has fears. Every man at some point in time has to make a decision based upon his own personal relationship and experience in life to say, I'm not giving in to my feelings, but I am giving in to my faith. And that's what you have the choice to do. Based upon previous experiences, I can give my wholehearted, 100% faith in God the opportunity to exercise itself because I know by what I've been through what God will do with me and I know that he's taking me all the way through. Now, if I didn't have those experiences, believe me, there are things that would shatter my faith, destroy my will to get up in the morning, and quite frankly, have leveled me and caused me to kill myself bluntly. Because when you're facing things like you know, people telling you you're going to die before you're 30, or you're facing things that really you have no control over, but you're told that it's impossible for you to be healed, or it's impossible for you to survive, those are things that kind of, you know, you go, huh, yikes. And how am I going to live? Suffering? Uh, yikes. So how do you go on? How do you keep on? How do you stay the course? How do you have faith? He went into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was still there alone. Matthew 14.23 The man, Jesus, felt the need of perfect solitude, himself alone, entirely by himself, alone with himself. We know how much intercourse with men draws us away from ourselves and exhausts our powers. The man Jesus knew this too and felt the need of being by himself again, of gathering all his powers, of realizing fully his high potential and his destiny. He recognized his human weaknesses and his entire dependency upon his father when he spent that time alone. And you know, you'll see that, that when you minister and the one thing I have found, and my wife knows better than anyone else around me, I can relate things in a very inspirational way or a very positive way, and this is the way I am every day. You know, I talk about Jesus, I talk about God, you know. Most people don't want to hear it, so I just don't tell them, you know. It's like, fine, you want to hear it? Go away, you know. Don't talk to many people. But those people that do, they know what my interest is and what my joy is. I talk about God. I enjoy God. I enjoy the freedom and the fulfillment of His Holy Spirit that comes inside me when I'm having the opportunity to share and relate the things that God is doing in my life in a personal way. Now, you may enjoy gossip, and you may enjoy politics, you may enjoy baseball, you may enjoy all those other things. I don't. It bores me to tears. As a matter of fact, it kind of like gets me anxious and kind of like, you know, burned out because I really don't want to hear all the carnal crap that people really lay down trips on each other and rip each other off of any peace, love, and joy they might have had. It wears me out. And you know, when it does wear me out, that's when I have to get away from people. I have to pull back, as it were, really stop everything and go, I think I'll stare at the sky, which is perfectly blue right now, for maybe an hour or two. I think maybe I'll work on my plants, you know, which seem to understand what it's like to grow because they just automatically do it for maybe a day or two, you know. Maybe I'll water the plants and tend the soil and kind of think about God, you know. And that's the difference between what I do, I think, and what a lot of people do. They think that having faith is something of just go to church and don't think. Me, I get alone with what I've heard and I think about it. My wife knows this. She'll say something to me and I'll think about it. I'll say no first and then I'll think about it. <laughs> so let that be a lesson to you. If I say no, it doesn't mean I mean no. Yes is yes and no is no for me, but I'll think about it. And if God tells me yes, then I'll come back and say, well, God just told me yes, so yes, right now I'll do it, whatever it may be. But my first reaction is usually no because most people don't think about what they're saying, much less what they're doing. So. I like to spend my time alone, away from what people are saying and what people are doing. I like to kind of like talk to God about it and then not even ask Him at times after I've asked Him once and leave it alone. If I don't get an answer right away, I leave it alone. I go do something else. I spend time alone. I become still. I get quiet. I stare at a tree. 
stare at a sunset. Watch a hummingbird fly. And I do that a lot around here. I love it. Just something about hummingbirds. Don't know what it is. Just something about them. Or I begin to appreciate the sun beating on my shoulders in October. And it's hot for me when other people may be putting on coats. The change of the leaves as I see them turning from green to brown and what that means and the sap, how it changes and it causes plant life to grow differently. Where the sun seems to be setting at this time of year and where it rises in the summer and says, I take that time with God to be alone. I find for myself, the longer I'm alone, the less I think about all the issues that everyone else has problems with, and the more I find contentment and peace without having to say a word, without having to think too hard about it. I think, more often than not, most problems that Christians face is because they don't think. That Christianity has become more of a feeling-based emotional ride as opposed to a thinking man's religion. Because my idea of having a personal relationship with God is God says something to me and then I think about it. Before God says something to me, I think about how I'm going to talk to Him. When I read something in the Word, I, I think about it. I think a lot about it. I don't just come up with a conclusion for this week. Sometimes I take years thinking about it. Matter of fact, I'm still on Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. <laughs> and everyone knows I've been quoting that forever. And I still come up with new stuff. Trust in. Not trust of. Not trust with. But trust in. You know, I mean, I've told people about trust in the Lord. But what trust in? Trust in? Huh. Not trust over? Not trust with? Not trust by? You know, I mean, I think of these things. You know, I, I think. You know, it comes clicking in here. And I enjoy that. Because when people normally, I've had a few people that talk to me that I'm really stimulated by in conversation, but more often than not, they're not thinking. Most people are just asking. And they just want a cheap answer they already know the answer to. So usually I give them the answer they already know. Because they're not thinking. <laughs> but God in His Word tells us that Jesus spent a lot of time alone thinking. How much more does the child of God need this to be alone with God? Himself alone with spiritual realities. Himself alone with God the Father. If ever there was one who could dispense with special seasons for solitude and fellowship, it was our Lord Jesus. But he could not do his work or maintain his fellowship in strength and in the power of the Holy Spirit without his quiet time alone with God. Would God that every servant of his understood and practiced this blessed art, that the church knew how to train its children into some sense of this high and holy privilege, that every believer may and must have his time when he is indeed himself alone with God. Oh, the thought to have God all alone to myself and to know that God has me all alone to himself. I've heard it said so many times lately by many, many popular Christians that they enjoy taking a shower or taking a bath or, in some people's case, visiting John, <laughs> whatever, going to the restroom, you know, and staying in there for the quiet time they have with God. And for me, you know, I, I God speaks to me in my bathtub, you know, I, I take a bath, you know, I relax and I'm laying there and I'm just kind of like, you know, not a care in the world and relaxed and that's when God speaks to me. But I also have a quiet time that I've chosen to make that I make sure I'm alone with God no one can see. It's kind of like my prayer closet in a way, but it's my very, very personal time that I know no one sees because I make sure no one can see it. And I'm very thankful for that because I can't do what I do now in Vidivo as much as it's expanded again, it's doubled and tripled in size, without that time alone 
with God. Because if I don't do that, believe me, my day falls apart very quickly and I stop working in the ministry. I stop doing whatever it is. And I say, Lord, I blew it. I need to stop whatever it is I'm doing. I don't want to misrepresent you like Moses did. I don't want to mistake what you're saying to me. I don't want to misunderstand or comprehend what a person is sharing with me. I want you to be revealed to them in Jesus. That Jesus becomes real to them in a personal intimate way. So stop me, I pray, this this day I ask God, every day, but I asked Him in that day, that you would stop me from anything that I might do or say or be that would misrepresent Jesus to the people. And God's honored that in a lot of ways, you know, and I, I thank God for that. But the point is you have to be aware that when you share things, like even now what I'm talking about, when I stop the video recorder, when I stop the video, I'll go post it and you know run it up into the internet and you know I'm kind of like wait for it to load and then I'll have to put a name on it and all that stuff. But the point is, when I stop, <clears throat> my wife knows I'm like a wet rag that's been wrung out. I'm tired. I'm worn out. I'm exhausted. And I don't go running out to try to do something more. I try to talk to God about it and say, is that enough? Because I enjoy it so much, I want to do more. I want to, I want to do a next one. Well, can we do another one, Lord? Can we share something? Can we, what do you want to say now? What do, you, what do you want to do? And sometimes God has to like tell me, stop, rest, relax. Don't go play like you know some of you do. You know you play arcade games or watch TV or do something of more input into your brain. But sometimes God wants you to stop so that He can be with you. Have you ever thought of that? Have you ever realized that maybe some of the things in your life that are going wrong is because you didn't stop long enough and God wants you to be with Him now? With Him still? With Him to be still? And maybe you'd hear His voice? How fast do you have to get up and get going and get on with what you're doing? How quick do you have to leave not the presence of God. I hate that expression, the presence of God. It's either God is there or God is not. It's not the presence. You know, it sounds so stupid to me, but some people hate, praise the Lord, if that's what you have to say, the presence of God, the presence of this, the presence is here, the presence is that. Instead of, Father, thank you for being here. Father, thank you for being alive and real. Daddy, thank you for helping me. Abba, thank you for being so intimate and real that I can have a relationship with the Holy God. Oh God, my God, thank you. And so, when you minister and administer as the grace of God has given you, don't forget that you could probably go right on sailing off a cliff. Unless you take that time to not just recharge your battery so it can keep going, but to really be still so that you can begin to know more so in an experiential way the living God. Because we already know that you can't live just by an experiential God. You have to live by the Word of God. You have to live by the Son of God. You have to live by the Spirit of God. You have to live by the experiential knowledge of God, which is wisdom applied of the knowledge of God that goes into your life's experiences as you relate to Him in a personal and intimate way. So, you know, if you really understood what wisdom is, then you'd understand that the experiential God is okay to say. But some people get into theological terms and they get all nervous when I say experiential God. Well, if God can't be experienced, you got the wrong God. <laughs> we don't just go on feelings of experience, which is what they're worried about, but we go on the experience of hearing God speak, and guess what? If He does, I'm listening. And that's what the point is. Are you listening? Are you thinking? Are you still before the Lord your God, your Maker?